Important event uh, uh, already started uh, two days ago about uh, this important uh, uh, celebration of the 14th anniversary of, of this significant uh, acknowledgement. Uh, indeed, as you know, the historic center of Florence was declared, declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in uh, 1982. And Florence has always been considered heritage of humanity at large. An heritage that consists not only of the monuments to attract visitors from all over the world, but also the material and immaterial heritage of cultural and literary works that great artists, poets, and writers have passed on to the world humanity and uh, which have made Florence famous at a global level. Our city and Tuscan in general is often associated to a vision that uh, enhances and promotes the quality of landscape. And this is a result of the close connection Florence has uh, with uh, its surrounding environment, which includes hills, the countryside, as well as food and wine traditions connected to the territory. So material and immaterial heritage are uh, very strongly Connected, integrated, and we we don't we don't have a border between uh, material and immaterial uh, world. And in 2015, with the establishment of the buffer zone, both in international panorama and in context of local urban planning, we undertook the first step towards the safeguarding and enhancement of the system relations between the city and the landscape. The goal is to establish Florence not only as a simple open air museum with uh, more or less 100 museums, so uh, one museum for each 4,000 inhabitants. I think it's uh, a worldwide record, practically. Uh, a collection of historical buildings, but rather as a historical urban landscape that is constant and the dynamic dialogue with the territory. This is an area that goes beyond the rigid formal limits of the concept of historic center. And this interrelations has been highlighted in 2021 with the approval of the proposal to extend the limits of the World Heritage Site by including an area of great value, not only in terms of cultural heritage, but also of nature and landscape. This vision is strongly present in the management plan, which was first drafted in 2006 and updated in 2016 as a tool to conserve and enhance the World Heritage Site. Because I believe that uh, uh, protection and promotion are two aspects that they have to be very strongly integrated. And uh, these, uh, and the three years after the publication of the monitoring of the management plan, this year we present the second update of the management plan. An essential step to the current management on the World Heritage Site and the application of everything that is required by the UNESCO World Heritage Center. Our future, dear friends, aims to strengthen the spirit of collaboration and interaction with the different stakeholders of our Territory, as a reminder of our duty in terms of protection and promotion and enhancement. A duty towards our heritage and to the general public to reflect on the strategic role that the local communities can play in economic and cultural growth and promoting peace and inclusion. This is another big challenge that we are facing. So how to have a board our citizens in this common uh, action in order to, uh, to, to, prom to promote and pro protect our immaterial and material cultural heritage. And in April 2023, 
Florence will host the next 15, as you know, the UNESCO Summit for the Celebration of the 15th Anniversary of the Ratification World Culture and Natural Heritage Convention, signed in Paris uh, uh, in, uh, in 1972. So this will be a significant year for heritage governance, a great opportunity to strengthen and deepen the issues related to governance and management, both locally and internationally. I am a firm believer in the strategic vision of cultural heritage as a living, breathing system in constant dialogue with its community, but also with the challenges that contemporary life faces, from climate change to urban development, in order to win these challenges, a dynamic and integrated governance becomes crucial. And to conclude, I would like to underline that we are starting the official uh, procedure about the candidature of the Scorpio del Carmo, the famous uh, uh, tradition since the 13th century from Florence, uh, to be part of the uh, immaterial uh, culture heritage UNESCO list. And uh, I would like to, to thank you for your support for this important goal that we, uh, we, uh, we have. Uh, in general, for, for this reason and many other reasons, I want to thank you for the work we all do every day for our uh, heritage, for our culture, because culture is the key of a sustainable development uh, of all humanity in the world. Also for the peace, because culture is the real vaccine against violence and the world. Thank you very much. much more than that because she has been twice I think you should be in the Guinness records you know, twice the president of the World Heritage Committee and a cost, constant presence in the evolution of the convention in the uh, analysis uh, of its uh, uh, nature scope and uh, function uh, throughout uh, the past uh, 40 years uh, at least so it is uh, our pleasure to invite you Christina to come to the podium here and uh, you know present your you know address please thank you Francesco uh, Mr. Mayor Nardella Madam Del Bianco president of the Del Bianco Foundation Madam O'Donnell Patricia who is the president of our World Heritage Foundation the new foundation that has been created mm -hmm. to support world heritage I wanted really to thank you all for the invitation to come here today and especially to congratulate Florence on its 40th anniversary of inscription on the World Heritage List. And it's very special today because it's the 50th birthday, literally, of the World Heritage Convention today. So it's a very special day for all of us. So I am going to try to offer my preliminary assessment of the first 50 years of the World Heritage Convention. I do this with humility and with the acknowledgement that it's actually impossible to make such a, an assessment on such a huge, broad program that has so much popularity in the world. And what I will do today is look at some of the achievements that I think have happened over that 50 years and some of the worrisome challenges which are sitting there. And I'm going to close with what I consider is a rather optimistic hope for the next 50 years. And I do recognize that this is an ambitious agenda for 30 minutes. And just to say that my first committee meeting, my first attendance at World Heritage was in 1987. So that means that I have been involved for 35 years with the convention, which is quite astounding. So let's start with the achievements. Um, I think one of the big achievements of the World Heritage Convention is the expansion of the definition of heritage. And the mayor referred to that in saying it's not just about buildings, it's about the territory and so on. In the early years, the kinds of properties that were inscribed on the World Heritage List are what I would call iconic sites. And by this, I mean sites that 
generally people would recognize at that time as obvious examples of what the convention was about. And in terms of cultural properties, just to illustrate it, early inscriptions on the World Heritage List that were all inscribed within the first three years included iconic sites of great antiquity, like the pyramids of Egypt, which would be evident, and the superb Mayan temples in Tikal, Guatemala. Th those were on the antiquity side and on the architectural monument side. We had the palace and, and park of Versailles in France, the Baroque churches and buildings in Brazil's golden age at the historic city of Ouro Preto, and the major architectural monuments of the historic center of Rome, including the, the, sea, the, the pontiff, the Holy See. On the natural heritage side, because the con convention obviously covers the two, um, excuse me, I would, uh, some of the inscriptions were really more about geology, the history of the, the history of the earth. And some of the very early inscriptions, one was the Galapagos uh, Islands in Ecuador, which was of course this isolated marine reserve that inspired Darwin to think about evolution. Dinosaur Provincial Park in Canada, which was really the dinosaur site with uh, 75 million years ago. Grand Canyon National Park in the United States, which has this deep gorge, which un unfolds the whole history of, of the evolution of, the, of our planet. And of course, Yellowstone National Park, also in the US, which contained half of the world's known geothermal features. These were the kinds of sites that were put on the list at the beginning. I think it's important to remember that. But since then, the idea of what is heritage has evolved. Cultural sites have shifted from this narrow focus on isolated buildings to a broad definition that first included streetscapes and then got larger with cultural landscapes and historic routes even larger, urban landscapes even larger, and vernacular buildings and vernacular site settlements. On the natural side, scientific discoveries and the inclusion, the influence of the indigenous perspective have changed our understanding and have marked a shift towards looking more at thriving interconnected ecosystems that eventually people understood it wasn't just the flora and fauna, but it was also the people that were part of that ecosystem. So this is an evolution that I think is important. But in spite of the expansion of those working definitions of heritage, some countries were certainly still dissatisfied that it was not inclusive enough. So by 1990, men, many countries believed that the World Heritage List did not fairly represent all parts of the world, and I agree. So to address this issue, the World Heritage Committee launched a project to see how one could achieve what was called a representative, balanced, and credible World Heritage List. This project, which was known as the Global Strategy, aimed to ensure that the list would include all the world's cultural and natural diversity of outstanding universal value. Looking back, I think you can say that the 1994 global strategy achieved two things. It identified imbalances in the World Heritage List at that time and listed them, and it proposed an anthropological thematic framework to encourage different kinds of nominations. And specifically, the strategy concluded that there was an overrepresentation of sites from Europe. There was an overrepresentation of places associated with Christianity among the world's religions, and an overrepresentation of grand monuments, which was referred to in the report as elitist architecture, in comparison to vernacular buildings and settlements. In, in hindsight, I actually consider that the most insightful comment in the Global Strategy Report is that sites representing living traditional cultures were absent. And it's interesting that the mayor referenced uh, Florence as a living, living, breathing, uh, evolving city, because this was really a very insightful comment. Because at that time, traditional settlements were only being looked at as architecture, which was very narrow. And uh, at that time, they didn't take account of their economic, social, symbolic, and philosophical associations 
or are there many continuing interactions with their natural environment in all its diversity? And I think the mayor's comments actually were very pertinent to that comment. The global strategy thematic framework was intended to encourage nominations from other regions. The framework had two overarching categories focused simply on our shared experience on the planet. Even culture, nature kind of disappeared. It was really about uh, human coexistence with the land and human beings in society. These are very broad categories, and they were identified to prompt countries to better understand it, what was meant. They included sub-themes like the movement of peoples over time, which is essentially migration, settlements, modes of subsistence, technological evolutions, cultural coexistence, spirituality, creative expression. So this was very much human experience and not so much into the, the silos of culture and nature from a, a sort of technical point of view. And as a result of the global strategy, several no innovative proposals did come forward, including the traditional settlements like the super cultural landscape in Nigeria with its strong and continuing spiritual associations, and more recently the sacred Kaya forest, forests in Kenya with their traditional settlements that are a source of the Miji Kenda's people's identity and spirituality. These were very different kinds of sites that came forward. And the global strategy also prompted uh, states' parties to nominate new types of heritage, like historic canals, industrial sites, agricultural sites, heritage railways, and some examples of 20th century architecture. So this was a big evolution over 50 years. And while acknowledging that, I do acknowledge that regional gaps and imbalances on the World Heritage List still need to be addressed. That's true. I believe that that expansion of the definition of heritage that has emerged through these global discussions is one of the great achievements of the first 50 years of the World Heritage Convention. Another important discussion in that first 50 years is the effort to bridge the nature-culture divide. As many of you know, an innovative feature of the World Heritage Convention, which was in fact ahead of its time, is the inter integration of cultural and natural heritage into a single international treaty. Until that time, there was very in little interaction between the two fields. Renowned expert in international law, whom I'm sure some of you know, is Francesco Francioni. And in, in an interview we did with him, he confirms that the convention is innovative for its unprecedented recognition and safeguarding of the most significant manifestations of what is man-made and the most extraordinary works of nature. So in the beginning, the process operated in two solitudes, rec uh, reflecting the historical development of a convention that actually combined two independent conventions draft conventions that were coming forward, one from IUCN on nature and one for culture being developed by UNESCO. The convention text itself actually reinforces the separation by presenting separate definitions of cultural heritage and natural heritage. And embedded in these definitions are diverse perspectives through which to construct outstanding universal value. So right from the beginning, instead of a holistic view of cultural and natural heritage, bridging the divide, the early experience em emphasized separation. A major breakthrough occurred with the creation of the cultural landscapes category. The discussion came about because there were a number of countries wanting to bring forward rural landscapes, such as vineyards and uh, the rice terraces in Asia and so on. And these sites were not deemed to meet either cultural or natural criteria, but they did have a combination that appeared to have universal value. Finally, the committee adopted a formal framework for cultural landscapes in 1992, defined landscapes, cultural landscapes as properties that represent the combined works of nature and humankind that illustrate the evolution of human society over time under the influence of physical constraints and opportunities presented by their natural environment. So the groundbreaking dimension of the uh, cultural landscapes, in my view, 
was the characterization of associative landscapes. And it really came about under the influence of an Indigenous perspective brought to the table by an Australian delegate. Associative landscapes were seen to ha as having powerful religious, artistic, or cultural associations with the natural element rather than any material evidence. This is a big breakthrough given where the, where the convention started. And I think it's uh, significant that the first cultural landscape inscribed on the World Heritage List was Tongariro National Park in New Zealand, which in 1990, when I presided the committee the first time, was inscribed as a national park under natural criteria alone. And three years later, it was brought back as a cultural landscape because Tongariro National Park, the mountain, was very important as it, for its associ associative dimensions for the... Um, the Maori people. So the cultural landscapes category has proven to be very popular, as many of you know. Uh, there are over 100 cultural landscapes inscribed on the World Heritage List. And I think it's really regrettable that at the time of the creation of the category, that the committee missed an opportunity to deepen the dialogue between culture and nature uh, because it decided to consider cultural landscapes under cultural criteria alone. And that decision effect effectively reduced natural heritage to a passive partner. That was a missed opportunity at that time, and we've come back on it now. Later, the cultural landscapes category showed that it didn't apply very well to large ecosystems, large protected areas with human settlements. So a catalyst for further consideration of the integration of culture and nature in large ecosystems arose in 2013, so we're getting close to our own era, triggered by a Canadian nomination of Pima Chawanaki, which was brought forward by Indigenous nations, and which uh, means the land that gives life. It's a vast boreal forest, it, which is the ancestral home of the Indigenous people, and I think that what they say about it is really significant. They say, the land is reflected in us. We are reflected in the land. It's very, very basic, but absolutely holistic and integrated. The issue for the committee when they looked at this proposal was to, the question was how to value the bonds that exist between the cultural traditions of the people and the natural environment. In other words, how could the World Heritage Program recognize the cultural systems necessary to sustain the natural values of properties? And how could the cultural value of nature meet the threshold of outstanding? It was a very good debate. It deepened our understanding of this relationship between culture and nature. And after five years, the committee listed the site as an example, an exceptional example of an ancient and continuing cultural tradition of keeping the land and of the exceptional bond between people and nature in this large protected area. So that is a step beyond cultural landscapes. And it really sensitized the committee to the inadequacy of its existing policy tools that in fact kind of institutionalized a conceptual dichotomy between culture and nature. Such obstacles as terminology, inscription criteria, and methodologies, as well as a lack of cooperation between the advisory bodies, stood in the way of accommodating the nature-culture continuum, continuum that was so brilliantly foreseen in the World Heritage Convention. And since then, World Heritage experts have been exploring integrative approaches. And while the 1972 convention is often praised as the only international conservation agreement to combine cultural and natural heritage in one instrument. As you can see, a deep understanding of the interrelationship between culture and nature has developed slowly and remains a work in progress. So let th those two are the things that I see as being really significant, expanding the definition of heritage and working towards understanding the relationship between culture and nature and deepening that understanding. And now I want to turn to protection and conservation. Uh, a recent article, I think it was last week or a week before, in the National Geographic asked whether world heritage status is enough to save endangered sites. It concludes that the World Heritage Program remains relevant 
if only because of the principle it espouses. And the principle is as simple as it is inconvenient. The world's diverse treasures require protection since they cannot protect themselves. That's our job. So it's worrisome to me that the committee and the state's parties spend so much time on nominations and so much money on nominations rather than on conservation. I think this is very important. I hear some colleagues agreeing with me out there. And remember that this, con this convention, while it's called colloquially the World Heritage Convention, its title is actually the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage. And even though the obligation to transmit sites to further generations is at the heart of the convention, each state party is left to its own standards, no matter how strong or how weak. So I want to look at some of the, the threats that are there. And one of the fastest growing threats is uh, climate change. And to show how much uh, things have changed, uh, climate change was not even a consideration in 1972, but now it is absolutely unavoidable. It exacerbates existing or predictable threats, for sure, and we have all witnessed the ex es escalation of these effects. The melting of glaciers that brings about rising sea levels, deteriorating permafrost, this is very true in Canada, that threatens fragile Arctic settlements and ecosystems and uh, how people can hunt and fish. Coral reefs that die from bleaching, Inland floods that destroy whole communities, drought, longer and bigger wildfires, intense winds, violent storms, and the list can go on. World Heritage has an outdated climate change policy. This is one of the worrisome parts of my comments. It has an outdated uh, climate change policy that desperately needs updating the policies from 2007. But the committee has not yet broken its current stalemate on new approaches and a new way of looking at the threats from climate change. What is clear is that the, stat the situation is not static. Every property will be affected by the effects of climate change. These effects will include both physical tangible damage and the loss of intangible values and a sense of place. People will be displaced and will no longer be in the place that they know. The World Heritage System needs to reflect deeply on what it should do if the outstanding universal value for a property which has been inscribed is affected. Will the site be delisted? Will it be nominated again for different values? What to do if the outstanding universal value is lost? Does it diminish our collective responsibility for the planet? There are very important questions to answer in relation to climate change. Another challenge comes from the increasing destruction of World Heritage sites in conflict zones. What is particularly troubling with the deliberate targeting of World Heritage and war zones is that it now stands in stark contrast to UNESCO's role to foster world peace, education, democracy, and reconciliation among peoples and nations. The preamble to the UNESCO Constitution says that peace based exclusively upon political and economic arrangements of governments is not a lasting peace, and that peace must therefore be founded upon the intellectual and moral solidarity of humanity. The trend to target World Heritage Sites began with the attacks on uh, Dubrovnik in 1991, followed a decade later by the destruction by the Taliban of the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan, despite appeals, direct appeals, and an envoy from the World Heritage Committee. The situation sadly was repeated a decade later during the World Heritage Session in St. Petersburg in 2012. Despite a direct plea from the committee, videoed in fact in front of the statue of Peter the Great, the uh, a radical Islamic uh, Islamist militia set about destroying the mosques and mausoleums in Timbuktu in Mali, a World Heritage Site. And of course, the destruction in recent years in Syria, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, and etc. has been massive. With limited powers at its disposal, 
UNESCO has condemned such acts of destruction and succeeded in mobilizing the UN General Assembly to adopt resolutions condemning the deliberate destruction of cultural heritage and trafficking of antiquities. But real accountability for such actions has been made and with the support and initiative of UNESCO, it's been made possible through the International Criminal Court in The Hague. In 2004, the court sentenced Mr. Jocic to seven years for the 1991 mortar attacks on Dubrovnik. And this is the court's first conviction for the deliberate destruction of cultural heritage. In 2016, Mr. Almadi received a nine year sentence for the destruction of the Mali religious sites. Once again, the court set a precedent by calling destruction of cultural heritage a war crime. On another front, one of the biggest challenges facing the World Heritage System is the rising demand from civil society and communities for meaningful involvement. Unlike other UNESCO conventions, the 1990, 1972 convention makes no mention of non-state actors. Uh, despite the significant role that civil society plays, a key role in protecting and conserving heritage sites in their local communities, as in Florence, as we've seen, the World Heritage Convention does not assign any official role to outside groups and organizations. In the early years, in fact, the committee discouraged community participation during the nomination process in order to avoid possible embarrassment to those concerned in case the sites were not accepted. So they didn't even want the, the local communities to know they were being nominated. It's a long way from where we are now. The turn of the 21st century marked a shift. In 2005, the committee encouraged participation from communities, stakeholders, and non-governmental organizations and added a fifth C for community involvement to its strategic objectives. It's a recognition that community involvement was essential to heritage protection despite the, in, because the interests of local communities need to be taken into account. But nonetheless, it was only in 2015, like that's almost 40 years, not doing math too well here, that civil society representatives were allowed to make two-minute interventions on specific sites at committee sessions. This is in 2015. And while that may seem like an important improvement, it's still problematic because those interventions were only allowed after the committee had made its decision. So they had no impact on the decision-making process. Today, there are many NGOs involved in heritage conservation, including the World Heritage Watch and the Indigenous in International Indigenous Peoples Forum on World Heritage. And our new uh, World Heritage Foundation that is now meeting here in Florence brings together heritage communities, organizations, scholars, professionals, and students to support the conservation of natural and cultural heritage. Its aim is to increase the uh, relevance of the convention, to make people know about the convention and why it's there and what to do, and its ability to protect our heritage for the next 50 years through three vectors, co-learning, advocacy, and exploring innovative people-centered practices. The lack of civil society involvement in world heritage decision-making processes and the prioritization of listing over conservation are both symptoms of an institution that is in need of renewal. Our world heritage envisages a way forward that includes civil society and meaningful roles to address conservation and management of world, site, uh, world heritage sites in communities everywhere. And there's one final challenge that I'll mention without going into it in much depth, and that is geopolitics. There's been a marked increase in the politicization of world heritage with the rise of national interests in contradiction to the spirit of the convention. These negative changes can be seen when states' parties protect their national interests over international interests, reject expert advice, and defend their own files. And it's, this politicization has certainly worsened since about 2010. I'll leave that there, but... After looking at the achievements and some of the challenges of the first 50 years, I'd want to conclude by sharing my hopes for the future. 
I really long to recover the original spirit of the creators of the convention who understood that we collectively have a responsibility to protect our fragile planet and our common heritage. I would like to see world heritage being used to foster peace, a lasting peace that is rooted in our solidarity with all human beings. And I would like to see world heritage sites as ambassadors for peace, as ambassadors for intercultural dialogue, respect, and caring for our planet. To do this, we need to break down the silos and curb polit politicization, politicization in order to come together to save the most precious places on earth. We need to tackle issues of exclusion, imbalance, and unfairness so that the vision of representing the diversity of the planet and its cultures in all parts of the world can be achieved. As the World Heritage Director Lazar Alondo Asomo so aptly said recently, and I quote, many countries are in the dining room, but they are not all at the table. The World Heritage Convention started as a peace project during the Cold War and the fear of nuclear destruction. The convention is still relevant. Let's capture this spirit as we move forward. And I want to close with an observation excuse me, from Madame uh, Lucia Vlad Borelli who, from Rome, who was the first woman to chair the World Heritage Committee in 1983 here in Florence. And we interviewed, Meshtil Grossler and I interviewed her as part of the World Heritage Oral Archives. And in her words, she said something that I think is absolutely pertinent for what we are talking about now. And that is the importance of the convention is to share problems and solutions with others. To list sites as world heritage raises awareness among visitors, but especially among the people who live there. The awareness of having something very precious, very important, something very well known throughout the world of something that must be protected. That is very a very important part of the convention. And I say that was well said. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christine. It's always a pleasure to hear your voice. Uh, you know, not only a, a living memory, but also you know an outlook for for the future of the convention and of heritage uh, in general. Now we have um, two testimonies uh, by Patricia O'Donnell, the president of uh, our World Heritage. Please, Patricia, join me on the podium. Um, and after that. Um, Carlotta Del Bianco, the president of the Del Bianco Foundation. Please, Patricia. Thank you, Christina. And I appreciate the mayor um, and his very appropriate remarks, uh, particularly about the territory and the historic urban landscape, which is um, something that I and others in the room were deeply involved in. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, Del Bianco Foundation for hosting us here in Florence and the um, excellent presentation, of a real uh, difficult one to try to capture in a few minutes, really 50 years of world heritage um, we have hosted over the past two days a series of three Globinars and four sessions framed around key issues regarding the evolution of the World Heritage Convention, the protection of heritage on a broader scale, and in the relationships to promoting skills and awareness, strengthening governance and management, engaging international heritage organizations, and of course, protecting heritage within the construct of citizens and communities. Our World Heritage is an expanding network of heritage advocates, co-learners, and innovators. With the working together, we seek to bring heritage into the future with an emphasis on local empowerment and sharing to build strength. We uh, recognize the collision of crises as a wake-up call 
Uh, and certainly Christina's mention of an outdated climate change policy is one of those things that need immediate attention or as soon as possible attention. Uh, we have some real issues about the contributors to heritage. And I think um, in my career, I've seen uh, perhaps a, an emphasis on heritage at all levels, the local, the regional, the national, and the international. The uh, contributions of heritage to sustainability are less recognized than they could be. And it is important to community resilience to understand heritage as places of carbon sequestration, um, uh, ability to adaptively manage, to have these assets come into the future in an effective manner. The multiple forces of rapid change uh, require collaboration, which is imperative. To address these challenges, the Our World Heritage Network undertook a global dialogue in 2021, looking at debates across 12 months and the critical themes that uh, reflected on those debates included climate, conflicts, uh, pandemics, rights, sustainability, memory, and, and several others. The issue is that bringing together those debates created a platform over 12 months where we had 600 speakers from around the world and thousands of participants. Moving forward, the dialogues that we've had this week uh, help us launch it through the World Heritage 50th anniversary, which we are very happy to celebrate here in Firenze. And the hope is that it will help our world heritage to build relationships uh, between and among citizens and communities and institutions. Thank you for the opportunity to serve the Our World Heritage Network. Thank you, thank you very much, Patricia. And thank you also for your, your role as, as president of our Association. And now, of course, Carlotta Del Bianco, the president of the Del Bianco Foundation. Please, Carlotta, join here. Thank you, Francesco. Greetings goes to our mayor and the town municipality of Florence. Dear Francesco, dear Patricia, ladies and gentlemen, um, the Romualdo Del Bianco Foundation, who I represent, uh, is very glad uh, for the organization of this meeting. And I am I'm, I'm happy to bring here, even though it's not a happy <laughs> situation, the greetings of uh, the Emeritus President of the Foundation, who is unable to be here, and the Honorary President of the Foundation, Munir Bushnaki, because uh, they both are ill, and the month is uh, not very nice. With, uh, with us, but uh, they are following our works. They are aside us and they are columns in the history and present uh, of the foundation. And since the present is not uh, just the moment that goes, but it is uh, the real moment in which we build the future, I, I feel that uh, this moment can uh, give uh, an, uh, a very wide opportunity and the wide sides uh, to the future of the next years for uh, the future of uh, world heritage, of course, but the future of uh, future generations. And this is uh, what we are focusing on. So from Florence, uh, it has been mentioned, this is the 50th anniversary of the UNESCO World Heritage Convention. It is the 40th anniversary of Florence enlisted in the World Heritage List. And uh, it is uh, in a way also the 35th fifth year of activity of the Romualdo del Bianco Foundation, which has always been an institution interested and focused on how culture and heritage can be tools 
for intercultural dialogue and peace, starting from the young people, starting from the university students, scholars, professors, who are dealing with these tasks every day. And that can bring firsthand one thing that uh, it is uh, one of the most important uh, besides the heritage, of course, protection and uh, conservation. That is the fruition of the heritage in a responsible way, which is the awareness rising in the communities of what is heritage and why it is important for us today for those who made the heritage in the past and for those who follow us. And uh, the foundation, alongside uh, our activity, and uh, today we have an uh, Opera di Santa Croce, the following of the festival that we have opened yesterday. And today we have a wonderful occasion of transmitting the values of the heritage to the younger generation with a, a big program with ICROM and the students of the high schools. Um, the foundation with the Life Beyond Tourism movement uh, uh, that is engaged with the program of Luoghi Parlanti, the talking places, in the process of raising awareness and educating the territories to know themselves and how to present themselves to the others with uh, their own reality, their history, their memories, their nature, their relationship, their know-how. The journey then represents an exceptional opportunity to encourage these exchanges, but the visitors and the places visited must be aware that these actions represent an exceptional opportunity that transposed on a global scale, can uh, contribute to the dialogue between cultures, to conscious uh, exchanges between people, and not just a simple commercial exchange, not just tourism. The World Heritage Sites become then rich in multiculturalism. They become centers of awareness on the importance and also of the responsibility of managing the richness given by this multiculturality of the visitors to favor interpersonal exchanges between all those who intend to participate in this evolution of personal education and that we have called the learning communities. In other words, all those who feel ready for this commitment, uh, for this change, uh, with the tourists who will be facilitated to evolve in temporary resident. The foundation takes then uh, its starting point from the 1972 UNESCO World Heritage Convention, but also from the 2003, as uh, President Bushnaki mentioned yesterday, Intangible Heritage Convention, and also the 2005, the Convention for the Promotion and protection of the diversity of cultural expression. And also it reflects the INAMES ICOMOS charter for the principles it express in the interpretation of heritage and its communication. The talking places though uh, represents uh, and uh, is a sort of uh, refined exercise uh, of analysis and communication that want to contribute, uh, uh, acting as a keystone to unify the theory and the research and the scholarly part and the practice of everyday life of every communities uh, uh, that stands and lives uh, in the heritage site, because they are not always in synergy, of course, each other. On the other hand, the meeting of uh, G20, the 20 countries that meet on the economic issues last uh, year, July 2021 in Rome, opened for the first time to the G20 of culture, which is, I think, a great success after so many years.
On that occasion, the importance of culture in the economy, in interpersonal and international relation was affirmed, a real opportunity for substantial contribution to the formation of the international community and its growth in peaceful coexistence. So I would like to uh, just give us our uh, three, um, let's say, uh, points, heritage for peace, for building peace, heritage for planet Earth, and a life beyond tourism, lots of uh, opportunities beyond the mere side of consumerist tourism, far beyond. So we are looking to travel to dialogue and culture and heritage sites are our starting points to evolve. And as uh, we, uh, we wrote in our uh, program of uh, Talking Places, uh, a travel to discover and learn about the world to embrace different cultures. So thank you very much. And uh, from the side of civil society within our international network of cooperation, which uh, goes around the globe with over 500 institutions in 111 countries. We are aside the, both of the words of institutions and uh, the town municipality to help with our work to make this hinge and its interconnection for what it is in our possibility. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlotta. Also, thanks again for the support that you are offering us you know, in this uh, occasion of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the convention. You know, we are very happy to be all together in Florence and uh, working with you and discussing among ourselves on our, our own activities and perhaps also, you know, carrying forward the reflection on what is ahead of us in, in terms of uh, uh, the role of the convention and the role of civil society uh, in uh, uh, the World Heritage Convention, the title that we have put there up front. Now it's time for our roundtable. I'll invite the members of the panel in order. Ibrahim Al Khalifa, who is the Deputy Director of the Arab Center for World Heritage based in Bahrain. And thank you, Ibrahim. I know you have to go soon, but we will you know, give you the floor right away so <laughs> that you can speak. Um, George Abungu, who is a former Emeritus Director of the Museums of Kenya and many other things, including I think he worked now at a, in Australia as a, in, in the Australian University, but you, you can tell more if you want about yourself. Mechtil Dressler, former but fresh, freshly former Director of the World Heritage Center of UNESCO. Metali Gupta from India, uh, architect, heritage researcher. Then we have Jad Tabet from Beirut and Paris, architect and planner and a former member also of the World Heritage Committee, also fresh former member of the World Heritage Committee on behalf of uh, his country, Lebanon. And finally, Mike Turner, um, Professor Emeritus of Bezalel Academy in Jerusalem and also former member of the World Heritage Committee. So we have here a group that has you know, seen many, many sides of the convention, has experience, has done a lot of work also to, you know, not only to manage the convention, but also to interpret it and carry it forward. Now, very, very quickly, I would like to um, make a very short introduction. This is the 50th anniversary of the convention. Um, of course, there were other anniversaries, and I, we have always tried to celebrate these anniversaries. Um, I don't think there was a 10th anniversary, because it was 1982, probably it was too early, the convention was just born, but certainly there was a 92, and I remember having seen papers there from former colleagues uh, like Presweer and others, they were trying to point on what were the issues already. Some of these issues have been addressed, but some have not been addressed. Um, for instance, the Presweer uh, book, which is, I think, still worth reading, 20 years of the World Heritage Convention, points to uh, situations of imbalance of the convention in terms of representation. Thank you. In terms of representation. Um, and perhaps also already what is a 
an issue that has been always brought up front, that the, the, a little bit of a contradiction between, you know, what is the universal message of the convention of one heritage and the great diversity of the, of the planet, you know, and as much as, more, as much as the convention evolved and included more and more countries and cultures, you know, these contradictions came, uh, came to the forefront more and more. The 2002, I can say I remember because I organized it, was in, in Venice, and at that time, you know, the focus of that anniversary convention was already mature, 30 years, was, you know, the expansion of the convention uh, through systems of partnerships. Uh, so we actually pushed that idea that the convention will not be just a, a UNESCO affair, but has to become a, you know, a, a global affair involving uh, other organizations, which at that time were already numerous, and today even more, um, uh, Governments, local governments. So it was under the sign of, of partnership, but I think it also, you know, influenced the, the the following decade because the partnership had been quite quite extended. Twenty twelve, the forty anniversary, it was under a colleague called uh, Kishore <laughs> Rao, who is not uh, uh, here today, but uh, um, I was also there. So we decided at that time that it was time to put the emphasis on the issue of development, the relationship between heritage. And development. It was at that time under preparation, as you remember, uh, the great uh, the, the the sustainable development goals of the United Nations and many other things. So we couldn't avoid, you know, showing that the convention wasn't an isolated affair, but it was actually part of the United Nations. So it was in a way linked to that kind of movement. So the issue in uh, 2012 in Kyoto was heritage and development. Now 2022. The 50th anniversary would have been certainly, you know, on another focus. And I think Christina has already mentioned some of them, the challenges I had, some of them very, very critical from conflicts to climate change and many others. Unfortunately, as you know, this celebration has uh, <clears throat> been obscured by the current international crisis. In 2021, the member states of the convention, of the committee, without knowing, of course, what was going to happen, elected Russia as the president of the committee. And when the war came up in February this year, when Russia aggressed and invaded Ukraine, and the mega international crisis in which we are all plunged, uh, it exploded, uh, nobody wanted to have the Russians around. Uh, I, I give names because normally there's also a lot of diplomacy on this thing. You know, a, a country has invaded another country. You know, it's been a really a clear responsibility of one country. Um, so, incredibly for everybody, the World Heritage Committee did not take take place. Uh, it's hard to say that, you know, because we're talking about heritage, heritage protection, and in the, in a way we see the clearest manifestation on how politics, in its worst sense invades the field of heritage and suppresses you know the most important meeting where you know from which many many heritage sites depend for their safeguard and their protection um, i think we are all under shock for this you know we still have not assessed exactly what the meaning of this but it's clearly an issue a mega issue you know, politics is devouring heritage is, is you know occupying the space that doesn't belong to to them um, of course we've been talking a lot in the past years about uh, politicization of heritage but this is nothing compared to what's what happening what's happening now where, in which um, um, an international crisis essentially wipes out you know, the entire system that has been designed for heritage protection. So there is a big, big issue. And I hope that this will stimulate reflection internationally, perhaps among the member states, because something has to be done. We cannot uh, at the same time say that we want to protect heritage and then let allow politics to destroy you know, the system. Uh, but, you know, of course, it's not in our hands. Our hands are the ones of those who cheer, care about heritage and want to promote the role of civil society in the convention. Uh, we think that this is part of the solution. If civil society had more role in the convention, perhaps there will be more shields to this intrusion of politics in the heritage field. Uh, and this, this is you know, really the, the background of all the things that we say and, and do. And you know, when we and Patricia mentioned we have organized in last year 134 events 
just raising the interest of civil society on, on the convention. It was for this type of stand to show that there is a great uh, public out there that is it cares about the convention and cares about heritage much more than uh, you know the restricted club of uh, um, member states that you know in, in effect allow the convention to be politicized and and, and in a way obscured by, by the politics. Okay, so we try. This is our this is our task, and this is what we preach. Now, the the this this. Now, at the same time, we are a platform that want to address issues that are forward looking, trying to understand what the convention can become in the future. We think this will exist. Of course, the convention will exist uh, hopefully in the in the future, but probably will also change. So I think that this discussion that we're going to have today will focus on this. Uh, perspective. You know? By the way, tomorrow with the, the Fondazione, we will open up another cycle of reflection. And this is focused exactly on the future of the convention. But we would like to use the fact that we have a very multicultural panel here uh, to address the issues, issues that are perhaps uh, very dear to our heart, but not often you know, brought to the, to the forefront. Um, I would like to divide this uh, discussion in two uh, two areas, two questions, essentially. The first question is, is around the values of the convention. Uh, convention uh, established a set of values, very humanistic, uh, Christina just reminded us, humanistic values on the role of heritage in society, the role of heritage for individuals, for, collect for collectivities, for, for communities, and so on. Um, and these ha <coughs> values have to do with uh, with identity, they have to do with uh, personal identity and, and with pride, social community pride, uh, with um, enjoyment also, because heritage is a very <laughs> interesting place, an interesting issue to, uh, to deal with, um, enjoyment and uh, education. So there are a number of values that are around, around heritage, but values uh, are not eternal nor uniform. So I think that one thing that has happened, uh, certainly will happen, you know, these uh, values will evolve in the future, will uh, adjust to different social needs. Uh, and, you know, it's something that we need to understand a little more. Now, how do, to do it? Well, I think essentially, you know, we have to look at ourselves, how the way which we, which we relate to heritage, but also look at what the younger generations are uh, doing and thinking. Now, this is what I'm going to address, why I'm going to address a, a question to our friend Ibrahim, because not only is young, younger than us at least, but also he deals with an educational institution. So you see coming in your institution uh, a lot of young people willing to understand, learn, bring their own contribution to, uh, to the convention uh, and to the world of heritage uh, in a region, the Arab region, which is also, you know, has not only has come a little bit you know, later to this uh, system, but also now has been struck by crises and conflicts and so on. So question is, is the question more like, a, you know, an, an assessment. How do you see the values, you know, of the convention adapting, you know, to the changing societies of the Middle East and Arab world and how the young people see that? What is the perception of young people uh, in, the, in your region, you know, on, on the role of the convention and the way in which the convention can play a role in their lives? Ibrahim. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Francisco, for the introduction. Thank you for giving us this platform to discuss and to meet with familiar faces and friends and colleagues. I think we didn't have enough events to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention due to several reasons, but I think this is one of the great opportunities, of course. Coming from the Category 2 Center in Bahrain, we are celebrating our 10-year anniversary, 2022. And I think it's a great time to, for reflection, but as well to look into analyzing uh, our region and to look into more engaging with the, with the youth, with the local communities, with the educational uh, institutions, uh, and looking into the next 10 years as well to look at how can we contribute to the international community efforts in that matter. Um, last year, we have initiated an um, initiative called Arab Youth for Heritage, which was uh, an open call for applications where they can document sites that they live next to and they can document a 10 minutes documentary and send it. And then the winners would come over to Bahrain and get a training on proper uh, filming, a proper documentary, a 3D documentation of sites, and etc. So we received 250 applications. That was really far, for, for, yeah, a lot more from our expectations. 
250 from different places like Yemen, Iraq, Libya, Syria, um, all very young, from um, ages 18 to 25. And we had five winners, two from Yemen, one from Iraq, one from Libya, and one from Syria. Um, and we, we invited them to come to Bahrain, and they got training on uh, professional filming and heritage. And we hope that we can further have uh, collaborations with the same group on and on other documentation uh, purposes. I think I just wanted to mention this example just to showcase that there is engagement, there is a lot of interest from the youth. It's a matter of how can we as organizations uh, reach out to those people and give them initiatives to really uh, support our efforts, but and be a major player in, in, in world heritage implementation in the Arab region. I think, as you mentioned, the conflict is unfortunately was a huge uh, issue over the last 10 years. And uh, one of the lessons learned was that the local communities are the real custodian of the sites. They, they were at the forefront of safeguarding the sites. We see that in Yemen, in Iraq, in Libya, in Egypt, where they created a human shield to protect the museum. It was not the military, it was not the police, it was the people of Egypt that came over and protected their museum. In Syria, we, see, we saw people protecting artifacts in their own homes, risking their lives, and some of them even lost their lives trying to protect uh, the artifacts. So I think those are all real examples that we showcase that there is engagement, there is passion around protecting heritage from the Arab people, from local communities. Um, but it is a matter of reaching out. It is a matter of offering, I think, opportunities for those people and uh, to make sure that we, as Category 2 Center based in Bahrain, we can have the right channels to, to not only work with state parties, but to work uh, with educational institutions, to work with uh, UNESCO chairs in the region. I think that is something that is lacking, and there is a huge opportunity on that on that front. And um, so, yeah, I think to look further than the convention, to look into more a, a, a local uh, approach and to look into a system into a system that we can have a inclusive um, uh, participation from 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 the youth especially good thank you very much it was very clear um i would like to you know sometimes i ask myself you know, what are, how the young people see heritage uh, because you know there's a lot of transformation not only social but technological things, you know, so a way in which uh, people perceive heritage and uh, use heritage. Well, do you have any impression on, uh, on this? I mean, how, how this changes the way in which people relate to heritage, especially young people that you teach? Yes, yes. No, I think we had a discussion yesterday on capacity building. I think one of the examples was when we first started doing our training programs was that it was by invitation only, where we were inviting state members to nominate participants. Over the last three, four years, we chose that we had a number of seats allocated to open applications from anyone, any uh, students, any participants, any professionals who are working outside of the of the member state or the official governmental channels. I think that really showed us that there, there is interest, but as well, we need to give them the platform to participate. And now in every workshop we have in Bahrain or in, or in a specific country, we have an allocated number of seats for uh, students or professionals or anyone who's working outside of the governmental agencies. And I think the gender balance in terms of participation is also very important. Um, over the last 10 years, we, we, we had a participation of more than 1,200 1, uh, in our training programs. And around 40% were females. And I think that is a good encouraging number. It shows that we had 60%, 40% uh participation and we're looking in the next 10 years to have further engagement and maybe to have 50 50 participation in all of our capacity building programs so i think looking to gender balance looking into participation of the of the youth students universities i think that is also very important okay thank you now i'd like to address the younger person here you know metali thank you for coming out of the lower the average age <laughs> you are from india I read yesterday that next year, India will overcome China in terms of the largest uh, populated country in the world. Um, congratulations. <laughs> but also, you know, this shows that you have a very large young population coming up. And um, I'm sure you 
you deal with these young people and so on. But I would like to hear your perception on really how this younger generation that is coming to the world probably, is this is the generation that we we work for. Right? When you say future generation, this is this the generation. And how do they perceive heritage? What is their role? Their role in in their lives? You know, and of course, there are many people, young people, see, see uh, very often attached to a screen or something. How this you know, is uh, in, in new inter form of interactions uh, are, are taking ground and what is the meaning of this? It's very difficult, I understand. Uh, and, and scores of psychologists, of cognitivist psychologists have tried to understand, but uh, no, not, not, we don't have yet a clear view, but perhaps uh, light can come from you, Metali. Uh, thank you for the question. The mic so, um, yes, I come from India. Uh, yes, I come from India, but I would say that um, I shifted to Europe in 2019 when I started the course World Heritage Studies in Katpus, a small town in Germany. And uh, I, before that, I left a master's in Leuven University to study sustainable architecture, and there was a reason behind it. I found that I do not want to do architecture anymore because I want to preserve what already exists instead of actually making new buildings. Uh, I joined this course, which is apparently the only course, the content of the course is so unique that this is the only course that you can find that teaches you about World Heritage, about UNESCO. And uh, in the beginning, it seems indeed like a privilege because not everyone has access to it. Now we have an online part of it. Uh, coming from different countries, at least 30 countries, uh, sitting in a classroom, you exchange ideas, you exchange about the cultural perspectives. Uh, indeed, initially, it feels as if heritage is a new life. You can connect to it at different levels. You walk down the street, you see heritage everywhere. However, the reality is that even today, unfortunately, heritage is for the elitist. Look around you and see how many young people you have. Wherever you go to the conference, if in the conference there are young people, what is their role? And I think you will get a better answer as to what stand do we have in terms of heritage apart from our perception. And I'm glad to say that someone is asking me as a young professional about my perception for the first time, because unfortunately, I thought that this question will be popped up to me after 30 years. So this is a pity. And uh, I think that the younger generation has much more capacity, and we have seen it during Corona, during the COVID times, because digitalization, the skill development is so important that we have made all of you the students of digital tools. We have captured it. So there is a time of intergenerational exchange, which is still lacking at all levels. So the perception of heritage it is one thing, but coming together to understand at the same page, to be on the same chapter of life, of heritage itself is another. And young people are motivated, they are passionate, but it is again a pity that we are waiting for them to gain the experience and become 50 to get the front stage. Um, Christina just mentioned uh, the key, the very most important uh, uh, scope for heritage, which is uh, promote dialogue and you know, foster peace. Uh, this, this is what is in the mind, of course, of those who created the uh, UNESCO. Do you think these values, dialogue, peace, and you know this triangle, uh, dialogue, peace, heritage, resonates with the young people in your experience, or it's something so be becoming distant? What, what is your feeling? Um, I think if. All of, I, I mean, I must uh, first of all congratulate uh, the El Bianco Foundation because uh, when they mentioned the young people, when you mentioned the students, when you mentioned small classrooms, that is where actually it begins. And today when we sit in the classroom and we discuss about the values of UNESCO, in the first semester you get really excited to work for the institution and the tables turn by the, by, by the time you have to write your thesis. Why does it happen? Because definitely there is a gap. And what is that gap? The gap is that the level of understanding between what the practicality is behind the four walls 
is, is just not there because you get the theory, but you do not get the practice. So the values have to be communicated in a manner wherein we are included. We talk about inclusivity, we talk about sustainability, we talk about diversity, but in, in terms of younger generations' perceptions and in terms of younger generations' contribution to the convention in general, I would really want to do a report and see as a researcher that how were the resources for the nomination of this World Heritage uh, uh, listings, how many of these resources were actually employing the young people? Were, were coming from India, I can say that uh, we have Archaeological Survey of India and we have, of course, INTAC. I was working for INTAC for a year on research on architectural styles of India. And I could see the discrepancy. I could see that as a young professional, for me to earn a living in the country, it will take another 20 years and I'm not ready for that. So we have to make heritage sustainable at very at all levels, at a level wherein young generation feels that they are included and there is a future indeed. And there is a gap. Okay, it's, it's very clear. Thank you. <laughs> now, let me turn to Georgia um, because, uh, you know, Africa is uh, probably the continent that will grow more rapidly in the past uh, coming 20 or 30 years. I've seen some demographics. I know, you know that today is the day humanity becomes 8 billion, you know, it's been uh, statistically, you know, the statistics of the UN have said 15 November is the, yesterday was actually, uh, was the day in which we become 8 billion. But apparently in, by 2050, there will be 9 billion and about a third of them will be in Africa. So it's really very, very important to focus on, on the future of, uh, of the continent. And the continent is especially with re related to our, our theme heritage is undergoing a very very important transformation there is a really almost a revolution i would say in terms of conceptual revolution in way in, 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 in the way in which people look at heritage consider heritage as part of their lives and their past uh, of course decolonization all these uh, you know terms are, are, are there but i think it's even more than that perhaps you can illustrate what's happening in uh, in this changing of values of in the african continent uh, and what is your view for the future uh first of all let me thank the foundation for the invitation and for the generous uh hosting of us in a fantastic and beautiful place it's really a beautiful place b and b where we are uh and of course our world heritage uh, which is a family uh the city of florence i was here i think in 2007 and i've never been back again although i come to rome quite often and even dolomite but i'm, I'm so happy that i'm back here so I'm very, very grateful for that. I'll take this back home, but thank you very much for, for this invitation. Now, coming back to uh, uh question, particularly uh, touching on the youth and the developments and the population dynamics in Africa. Africa is a very complex place. Uh, because Africa is also the cradle of humankind. And uh, humanity began there. And we're starting to try to revisit uh, this history of our contribution to the world. But Africa also has been a victim of uh, a lot of things, um, slave trade and slavery, uh, exploitation through colonialism, and uh, some of the effects of that still live with us up to the present. And of course, not going into that kind of history, but uh, looking at the convention and the World Heritage Listing and the youth and the population dynamics. And you're right to say that uh, by 2050, probably there will be, Africa probably will have the, uh, the youngest and largest population. And all these people are hustlers. I don't know whether you understand the language of hustling, um, where they are, they, are, they are trying to survive. And they are trying to survive by all means. Some of the best creations 
uh, in terms of technologies coming from Africa. Africa actually invented the money transfer long before Europe, and Europe was very behind in that, the America. Now, now this money transfer through the fund has become international. It was invented in Kenya through Safaricom. Uh, some of the youngest entrepreneurs are actually coming from Africa in terms of IT, if you follow clearly. So you have all this extreme uh, kind of uh, disadvantaged situation and also people hustling to create opportunities. Now the question is, what does heritage bring in all this play? For the young who are not brought, attached to that particular foundation, to that particular ground, to their cultures. They have detribalized de de themselves. They have no tribe. They have looked themselves like Kenyans, if they are Kenyans, Tanzanians, South Africans, they don't want to be put into a box of languages and all these things. So that provides an opportunity for a nation identity building, but at the same time, it also takes them away from their roots and their appreciation probably of their heritage. I'm not saying that they don't like or they don't want to. But I think that there is need to, sus to, to actually try to bring out the relevance of heritage in their lives, including in the new technological development that are going on. And I think Mike will probably talk about that because there are also good examples. Uh, what is called the, the youth hubs. And Kenya has one of them and, you know, uh, Benin and other places where there is a systematic attempt by heritage institutions, by ICROM, by UNESCO, to create hubs where the youth may be able to express themselves and may be able to innovate and use technology to create products based on heritage. For example, I just want to give you a very quick uh, uh, experience that we have. We have sometimes very bad traffic jams. Uh, the transportation system is probably not as quick as you have in the rail here when you are using matatus, you know, small vehicles. And so people can be on the road for even up to two, three hours going to work. So you wake up early in the morning. Now the question has been, can the youth use technology to create some entertaining uh, products or educational or intellectual or whatever products that people can be able to use while they are sitting in traffic jam and enjoy that ride every day using technology and using heritage products? So you have these young artists coming up with different kinds of products. And that is actually a better way of that, including world heritage. So in Africa, we have to think very hard. While it is obvious in the developed world, and it is easier to access some of these, it is a hustling experience in the South. And so every young person is a hustler to be able to reach that. Now the question is how can we then transfer this hustling experience to these young people to be able to benefit out of heritage? They can no longer just protect it and conserve it for the sake of it. We must be able to ask difficult questions. What is the world heritage bringing to them? What is, even for communities, we have to ask that. And that's why I, I am sort of ambivalent about this question of heritage and politics. I, I am one person who do not want the world heritage to be politicized. But at the same time, I think that we need politics and politicians to promote heritage and to use it for creating peace and development. And so I don't want to say, 
politics is bad for heritage. I think good politics will be very good for heritage because good politics will ensure that the youth are included in the discussions and in the agenda of nation building using heritage. I think it will discuss on how women are represented equally in the discussions of heritage and sustainability. I think it will help us in looking at the disadvantaged communities, how they can be brought into that. It will help us look at communities and how they can be brought into that. And I think Africa is an experimental ground for that particular place because we don't have a lot. And the little that we have, we have to hustle around. And I think the future depends on how we hustle in a positive way to create opportunities for the youth who are, we call them the future uh, managers, but for me, the future is now. Um, it is now. And, and they have to be part and parcel of that. Uh, lastly, I think that there has been this tendency to take advantage and create narratives. For example, youth. And we say, oh, we are giving opportunity to youth. Oh, we are giving opportunity to women. Oh, we are giving opportunity to uh, the disabled or the physically challenged. But who are we? Who is doing what for who? Are you doing it with them or you are doing it for them? Because if you do it for them, you're not involving them. If you do it with them, then you are doing something. And I think in the heritage sector, we need to start to work with them, as uh, Gupta was saying, so that they can start to feel that. And I think in Africa, the question is that the youth are now questioning us and saying, if you do it for me, without me, you are against me. I want to be part of that discussion on the table. So this is what this population dynamic is bringing. This is what hustling in the, this difficult situation is bringing. This is what difficulties that we have is bringing. And for me, this is part of the decolonization process because the baggage that was left behind is now being dismantled when people start to question everything that they do, including the relevance of heritage, including the relevance of world heritage. Thank you. Let's not finish, not finished. I have another set of questions to hand over to <laughs> Because you so elaborate that. No, I mean, but of course, you know, we, we, we have seen in the past decades, uh, Africa you know, has undergoing a great rapid development process. So very often we had this conflict between heritage and development. In fact, I even noticed that even the concept of development and sustainable development has been somehow, you know, uh, you know, uh, in a way, confused. Uh, uh, we have seen in the recent uh, years, you know, many development processes which were very destructive of heritage, termed as sustainable development. Um, so this is another scenario that we have uh, to face. Uh, it's, it, it is related to what you were saying, you know, because people, especially young people, want to understand what comes to them. But, you know, this is where the politics come into the game. Right? And, and it's not good politics, right? <laughs> because it's, it's politics play, they play, you know, interest, of course, of uh, uh, investment groups and these kind of things. So how, how do you, you manage this? Uh, uh, how do we clarify this confusion that is, I see appearing in the in the in the in the world of heritage, mostly in Africa, not only. Yeah? Also in Asia, we have seen similar things, uh, like Bangladesh in particular. Um, what is your view on that? I'm not very clear on on the question itself. You you talk about the issue of development yes. and the inbuilt uh, uh, sort of uh, contradictions, and also on the issue of. Um, can you be a little bit... Well, the case, the case that I have in mind is the Selu um, Park Gang and Reserve in yes. Tanzania, where you now they built it. They want absolutely, to, absolutely. Yes, you are, you are right. You are right. I think, I think that we have to look at these issues in a very sober way. Um, what was the decision of 
IUCN at the end of that process. Now, the committee decided not to, uh, not to take it out not and then to actually carve. And they say that whatever they are carving is still good enough to be a world heritage. That's what so, the so, so, so you, you see those internal contradictions. Because I would have loved to see Selu go out of the world heritage as, as, as an example. Because if they flouted the rules, the rules should apply. But if you have a site that you can still carve out and leave a huge part and whatever remains still remain a world heritage, then it means that there must have been a problem in the beginning. You must have taken a site that was absolutely so big and left the communities sort of helpless. So in a way, the politicians may be right and justify that what they did was right, even if it is wrong, because the, the bodies that are concerned with this are still agreeable to it being subdivided. And the one part that has not been touched continues to be a world heritage and the other one is okay. So I think we need to look at that. I think that it's very dangerous to apply these things in different ways because a precedent has been set there. So if you have set a precedent in Selu, how are you going to tell someone else somewhere that they cannot do the same? So we are in a catch-22. But some of these Kaj-22 are out of historical problems. Because look at Serengeti. It's huge. It has got its own problems. I know you are dealing with the issue of the road and all that. But at the same time, the government will come and say, so do you want us to just stick like this? What about the people who are here? And I think that we need to be able to reflect and reconfigure really the decisions that were made 30, 40 years ago, are they cast in stone or are there ways in which we can provide alternatives? So as much as I agree that we should not have double standard, we should not be allowing things that the convention does not accept, you know? But I also, I live that, that life and I know that and things are changing and people are demanding and politicians are saying, if I don't do this, I'm out of the place the next day. They also have to protect their skins. Huh? Yeah, okay. But within a situation of an earlier probably mistakes that should have been rectified. So this is part of the decolonization. And the, the whole process of decolonization, if you ask me, I can talk for, uh, for two or three or four, four days. Uh, so I will avoid doing that. And it comes also with issues of restitution. Italy was one of the counties that actually restituted to Ethiopia. You know, the obelisk many, many years ago before it became fashionable with the, with, with, with the, pres the president of France. Now everybody's talking and everybody's getting credit and no, Italy is not even being mentioned. <laughs> okay. That it actually returned anything. And lastly, to finish, <laughs> to finish, we, 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 we need to agree that there are some of these issues that were inbuilt because of historical reasons and that we need to look at it. I very, really love the way Christina has given us that history. When the fathers and mothers of the convention, although I'm not sure that the mothers, but there are two, when they actually came up with this vision, it was very beautiful. But I don't think that in their mind, they wanted Europe and North America to run away with the convention and leave so many sites and leave the others behind. Because one of the earliest sites, two of the earliest sites, Lalibela and Aksum, 1978, Ethiopia now has eight. How many do you have here? 50 what? I heard that Britain has 30-something, Spain probably 40-something. They were not even in that first list. So how do you explain that to the youth, to the communities, and to everybody else, and still say, we need to maintain this vision that the fathers had? The vision was not to run away with that. We need to reconfigure and revisit 
this whole convention. We can't change it, but as we have done before, we can use other means, including the global strategy, which was very helpful for Africa, and, and try to see what good we can do. And lastly, I'm very proud that Asia brought for us the NARA document, Africa brought the traditional knowledge systems, which is now accepted as a main way of protecting heritage. And also this whole issue that has now been appropriated by the West and others of the divide between nature and culture. It was Africa. And the divide between material and material, it came from Africa. We are the ones who are calling upon these things for years and nobody listened to us. And then now, Ecomos will say, oh, we introduced, you know, the traditional knowledge system. They were against it. So we know this. We know the road. We've come a long way. And we need to revisit some of these things and be truthful and transparent to ourselves if the future of world heritage is going to be ensured. And Africa needs to get its rightful contribution and its rightful space within the humanities uh, um, arena of discussion. Thank, Thank you, George. Thank you very much. I think you're raising issues that are really at the core of our reflection as our world heritage and how, how to address changes in, uh, in, the, in the future. And I, 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 I hear what you're saying. I think they're quite interesting. But I would like to now tap on the brain, on the youngest brain we have around, which is next to me. <laughs> Michael, because Michael has been an explorer of uh, the world of heritage and the convention all his life, and um, certainly has a, you know, has a long view. And I would like to ask him really a question that has to, to do with this. Now, how, how changes will affect the convention? Changes in population, demography, social changes, uh, urban uh, development, metropolitan expansions, all these processes that will characterize the next decades are going to change our view of heritage and therefore it will change the convention. I think we better get prepared because they are coming. So what do you think about it? Well, um, I think 2007 was the, um, the watershed, which was really the point where, according to the UN statistics, that most people were living in cities. But it was also the time of Kindle, of... Um, uh, Airbnb, everything was happening then. Uh, Thomas Friedman, in fact, in a, a lecture at the United Nations, actually said that we didn't understand what was happening in 2007 because of the economic failures of 2008, which overshadowed the activities, what happens in 2007. But the changes which we found, which moved us from the monument and the site to actually understanding urban heritage was really something very critical. Uh, this was what the historic urban landscape did, is that it expanded um, our understanding both spatially and temporally. And the importance, therefore, of the historic urban landscape was um, a major understanding of urban heritage. Uh, whereas the monuments and we're in buildings like this are made by princes and uh, emperors, uh, urban heritage is made up by civil society. They're the people who create then the urban heritage, which is dramatically different. But if we then link this together to 2007, then we have then yet uh, moving from the monuments to the city. Well, 2007 moved us from the city to the metropolis. And this has brought us now a completely new dimension. And in the same way as that the city is not a group of buildings, the metropolis is not a large city. And this is going to make us an understand or, or create then new understandings for heritage and how, in fact, we are managing uh, large conurbations, uh, George spoke about Africa and Francesco said about youth in uh, numbers of areas. If we've got half the population of Africa is less than the age of 20, uh, in another 10 years, we we're just going to see uh, urban explosions which are going to take place. What is this heritage? And I think that this is going to be a major challenge. But what is metropolitan heritage? Well, I think uh, 
uh, we were actually thinking about, well, what is the heritage of the metropolis? Uh, and I think that what we're seeing is now a new fragmentation. Well, whether, in fact, we can see, okay, people will come to Florence because it's a single unit, but actually understand the metropolis will then have a new fragmentation, which will then take on board the... Uh, social, the socioeconomic transformations, uh, bringing different groups of people and a multiplicity of identities which will take place together. It will no longer be a homogeneous idea, but it will be something which will come up from um, engulfing and encompassing um, larger groups of populations. Not clear yet what metropolitan heritage is, but maybe well, we don't have that, an We, we don't yet have it. That's why we're all working on it hard. And a question from Michtil. You know, you're listening to this changes, a new type of you know, new perceptions, uh, new heritage uh, forms, uh, uh, contexts. Uh, and if, if we look at the next few years, which is very courageous and sometimes risky, um, I can see that the convention is a very tight shirt for, for all these changes because the rules that we have there uh, change with a pace that is more Jurassic you know, than, than, than the society around us. So what, at some point there will be a clash between demand and supply. So what do you, how do you see this thing happening? It's already there. The crisis is already there, but it might become even worse in the future. First of all, um, it's wonderful to celebrate the 50th anniversary of uh, this convention among friends and old colleagues and to have a very frank discussion of where we are going for the next 50. So um, that's really a, a big challenge um, to look forward um, on the basis of the, the convention. But actually, if you look at the convention itself, it was always an instrument where those founding fathers and the few mothers you mentioned um, uh, gave it um, a kind of framework, which is a very broad framework. If you read the preamble, they already looked at threats which are beyond traditional threats uh, to heritage like decay, etc. Um, in 1972, um, we had a huge crisis, which was a pollution crisis. You remember the book um, by Carson on Silent Spring and so. Today, we have a triple crisis of uh, climate change, biodiversity and pollution, including marine pollution. So um, the world is in a different situation than 72. But actually, the framework of the convention is a broad framework. However, there are areas where, um, and this came out of this discussion also, where uh, the convention has to move ahead despite uh, the framework um, to include civil society, communities, etc. And that is actually difficult in an intergovernmental context. I have to acknowledge that. There were some movements and, and Judd and the others in the committee uh, remember, I mean, um, there was a day before the World Heritage Committee where uh, um, NGOs uh, intervened. Over time, there was also the World Heritage Youth Forum. There is now a forum of site managers, but the voice is not brought to the committee. But the committee is two weeks within the year. I think the voices need to be uh, included uh, actually on the ground from the very beginning, parallel to what Christina said, we had the iconic buildings in the beginning and um, there were the top-down approach for the nomination. So it was decided at the ministry or at the National Park Service which side would go forward and they drafted it. They even didn't consult with the people on the ground. Now today it should be really everywhere in the world a bottom-up approach. People, It's the people's heritage we are talking about. It's not a uh, a top-down approach cannot work for management on the ground. And um, this is why I personally think uh, on a daily basis, the convention can work with the people included, where the challenge is, is at the decision-making process and, of course, at the institutions um, to include uh, different actors. And I think civil society and indigenous peoples, we have come a long way, but there is a long way to go for the next 50. 
<clears throat> yeah, but at the same time, sometimes I have the impression, maybe I'm wrong, but you're a fresh uh, uh, retiree, so you can tell me what happened in the past uh, few years, that UNESCO has somehow taken a kind of a, it's been closed. I mean, it, it, it's closed a bit the doors uh, in terms of, uh, it sees everybody else as a competitor, you know, it sees the other UN organization as competitors, it's like uh, the other um, NGOs that operate uh, uh, it's a very strange feeling. I don't know whether it's true or not, but uh, because the world has changed dramatically. You know, when, when UNESCO was created, there was only one. You know, and now you look at the panorama of actors in the heritage field, it's very, very extensive and, and rich, especially in the nature of natural heritage, maybe less in the cultural heritage. Um, and I'm not sure that this diversity, multiplicity of actors has been incorporated in the working, uh, daily working methods and spirit of convention and UNESCO at large. What is your feeling as a fresh retiree? There are many things I, I could say. There is, of course, there was also a movement, even when you were there, uh, Francesco, to open up, uh, up the other conventions. World Heritage became so important because it's universal. It has more members than UNESCO has, as you know. Um, more member state, states parties than UNESCO member states. And it became so important for people around the world uh, in terms of job creation, in terms of how people care for their heritage. Now, the other uh, conventions had less participation. And so there was a move within the institution uh, to promote some of the other conventions, especially illicit trafficking and um, also um, diversity of uh, cultural expressions. And if you actually look at the text of Mondia Kult, you don't find a paragraph on world heritage. And this puzzled me personally. How is this possible that you have two paragraphs on illicit trafficking and not a paragraph in the year of the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention? My question to the states parties who attended which attended uh, the uh, uh, this big uh, event now i think there needs to be an opening up uh, also of the institution of unesco which by the way has been the constitution was founded on the same day uh, 16th november about 1945 so it's another celebration we have today and this constitution still stands today in a world where we see another war in europe um, I think we need to uh, really promote peace and peace you can only promote where you use these platforms and World Heritage is a fantastic platform for dialogue and peace. So the opening is there, but I think the institution also has to open up. In order to, to open up the convention in 2021, we with a number of friends from some member states uh, uh, proposed a very innocent amendment uh, to, in, the, in the General Assembly. You know, when they discussed the 50th anniversary of the convention, there was an amendment that says, considering the importance of the relationship between the world heritage and civil society, the assembly General Assembly encourages member states to develop relationships with civil society and so on. This was very innocent. Well, much to our surprise, it sparked three hours of discussion on the, on the term civil society. Judd was there. Judd was uh, sitting as a, a representative of Lebanon. I think I was watching you. You were, you know, with your eyes wide open to see you know, because this uh, debate that took place, I think, should be really seen. It, it was an amazing debate. You know, and of course, those who didn't want the terms of society said that it was this term not been used. Or there was something, you know, that was not in the text. Uh, so on, so on, so on. At the end, it was not accepted. We did we because at the end there is always some form of okay of consensus, and so it was not accepted. So civil society is an unwanted banned term in the World Heritage Convention. It's not a good start for an organization that promotes the role of civil society. But I thought it was a very interesting thing, and I am addressing to this question to Jad. You know, how do we? change this thing? How do we promote really the role of civil society, you know, in the convention as a major change of the convention? Because the changes will not come unless there is an, you know, this convention, UNESCO, the member states embrace the changes that happen in society. So how do we do it? By the way, I just want to notice that he's the only one <coughs> that 
explained you know, and supported the amendment <laughs> from uh, from the south of the world, you know, saying, okay, we want to, to have a civil society. Well, I will speak, uh, I will start with my personal experience. Uh, two years ago, a little bit more, it was on the 4th of August 2020. There was a huge explosion in uh, Beirut Harbor. It has been said that it was one of the biggest ex non-nuclear explosion during the 20th century. It destroyed uh, one third of the city of Beirut. It was affected, not completely destroyed, but affected. More than 250 persons dead, more than 3,500 wounded, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this happened in a situation where Lebanon was witnessing a terrible political and economic crisis. No government, uh, uh, banks were uh, uh, blocking all the money of the people. You cannot take your money from the bank. You are allowed to take only $400 uh, dollars per month. That's all. Uh, no possibility for the Lebanese government to do anything, to intervene on the ground. No possibility for uh, people to take their money from the bank and work on the ground. So the second day on the 5th of August, I was on the ground. I was there. And I saw hundreds of young boys and young girls working there, removing the, the rubbles, sorting the rubbles to keep the stone, the curved things, etc., the wood, helping people in their homes. These hundreds of young, you were speaking about young generation and heritage. These neighborhoods are not a historic center. They are not inscribed on the World Heritage List. They have very interesting topographic features between the hill and the sea, near the port. A mixture of old handicrafts and of new uh, cultural industries. Uh, a mixture of old population and young uh, generation coming there, artists, etc., etc. Well, but what happened is that really this part of the city was considered by the young generation as their heritage. These people didn't try to think, well, uh, uh, how can I build a career in heritage or how? No, they were there on the ground and they started working. And what happened is that with this mobilization, mainly of young population, mainly of young population, the neighborhood now is almost completely reconstructed. Life has again uh, re restarted it there. Just one, just one small example. In 2019, before the explosion, there were 11 art galleries in this part of the, in these quarters. Now we have 40 art galleries with mainly young artists, young artist production. I mean, this is just a small example. This is just a small example. This was done with the mobilization of civil society. You had NGOs that were created. Obviously, there was help from international, some international organization, a little bit UNESCO, ALIF, etc. But you have also a mobilization of Lebanese diaspora, and then a lot, a lot, a lot of work. People were working on a voluntary basis because they considered that this is their heritage.
It's an example of the mobilization of civil society. How you can really rebuild heritage, re-give value to heritage, even if it's not inscribed on the list, even if it's not, uh, you know, how heritage can become part of the life of the civil society and of young generations. And what's interesting in this, and I will finish with this, what's very interesting is that when we started discussing, I'm not young generation, but I was working with them. So when we started discussing about what makes the heritage of this area, and we couldn't find anything except the historic landscape approach. This was the, the, the tool a tool that we used with the people, with the young generation, to explain what we are doing and to find ways for expressing the value of these places. That's all. The great, a great case that you were saying. Uh, just a question, corollary. I mean, if you were uh, uh, to give an advice, how do we strengthen the role of civil society in this system, you know, make it pessimistic, so intergovernmental, okay. But is there a way that we can follow? I think this should be done basically in, uh, Meshtel said that the committee meets uh, once a year, okay? But between one meeting and another meeting of the committee, life continues. <laughs> life continues. <laughs> And this is, for me, the role of the center, basically. The center should be the place where, uh, the, where, you, where the voice of civil society can come. And it sometimes works. It sometimes works. I mean, uh, not always, but it sometimes works. I know examples where the center uh, was able with the help of the advisory bodies, ECOMOS, IUCN, etc., etc., was able to be a place where the voice of the civil society was heard. I had examples in Lebanon, she knows <laughs> to uh, what I am referring to, but we have examples everywhere in the world. So I think that basically it's the work of the center of, of, and of advisory bodies between the committee meetings. And when we build up progressively the culture of civil society involvement in heritage through the advisory bodies through the center, through experts meeting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, maybe at a certain point, this will reflect in the committee. That's a good, uh, good proposition. I, I think we, we should listen to you <laughs> because you're, you're wise and experienced man. Now, um, we have some guests here. If any of you has uh, any question uh, for our panelists, uh, this is the time for... Uh, I see some, some students there, so maybe you have uh, listened to some interest to these propositions. Uh, if you have any question or even from this side uh, to, to our friends, this is the moment. Uh, I think we've gone through a lot of material, you know, maybe uh, it takes time to digest all of this, but certainly we have touched on the key issues uh, that concern the, the future of the convention, the youth, the younger generation and the, their approach to heritage, ways in which we have to adjust certain mechanisms and principles and you know, paradigms to the changing world. It's very, very important that this is incorporated as, you know, as a task. Um, in inclusion of new actors. You know, there are a number of new actors, maybe some of them even we don't even count today. You know, I'm talking about thinking about what the role of social media and so on, all these kind of new powerful actors that are completely, you know, not, uh, not included in the, in the, in the process. Um, and the politics. No, of course, the politics is a necessity of human beings, so I'm not saying that we can do without, but certainly we have to try to harness uh, the, the, the negative impacts of, of that. Uh, unless we somehow manage, you know, reassembling all these elements, you know, it will be difficult to 
uh, face and you know challenges that are ahead of us uh, we are already present uh, today like climate uh, or or development pressures or all sorts of or conflicts or, or or even not not necessarily armed conflicts but the conflict between you know um, values of different communities i think it's important to to somehow as christina was saying Put, up, put in front of us the, the, the original spirit of the convention, but know also that this uh, has a to, to face and meet a different society. So we have to give ourselves the tools to address this. Thank you very much to all of you, and thanks to all those who were present today. Thank you.